Hello and welcome. It's nice to see you all. I'm Hen Henrietta Huldish, a Chief Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs at The Walker. And we're really thrilled to have all of you here today to celebrate the opening of uh, Keith Haring Art is for Everybody. Before we start, I'd like to ground us by acknowledging that the Walker Art Center and the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden are located on the ancestral and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people, and that the site that we're all gathering on today was once expansive marshland and meadow that holds meaning for Dakota, Ojibwe, and people from other indigenous nations who live in the community today. Um, Keith Haring, Art for Everybody, endures the enduring influence of an artist, of an incredibly prolific artist who Dis forged a very distinct visual language, which I think is really a pop cultural phenomenon in its instant rec recognizability. Um, it is also work that continues to resonate for its um, urgency, for its prescient engagement with critical social issues, and also for its celebration of solidarity, community, joy, and hope. Um, we are really thrilled to be uh, presenting this ex exhibition here in Minnesota. It was organized by The Broad in Los Angeles. And it is my great pleasure to acknowledge all of the generous funders, friends, Walker trustees, National Advisory Board uh, members, who helped us bring this dynamic show to Minneapolis and for our communities to experience. We are incredibly grateful to have received lead funding from the KHR McNeely Family Fund, thanks to Kevin Rosemary and Hannah Rose McNeely. We're also grateful for the generous funding provided by Louis Baskerville, Walker trustee Jan Breyer, National Advisory Board member uh, Pat Denzer and his wife Lisa Denzer, Walker trustee Jennifer Martin of the Martin Burton and Brown Foundation, the Polad family, including Charlie Polad, um, Walker trustee Charlie Polad, and National Advisory Board members Donna Polad, as well as Becky and Bob Polad, Walker trustee Keith Rivers, National Advisory Board members La uh, Laura and uh, John Taft, Walker trustee John Whaley and his wife Annette, and Walker trustee Susan White and her husband Robert. And I want to extend a very warm, uh, warm welcome to all of you who are here today. Thank you for your commitment, for your generosity, and for making the things that we do here possible. Uh, lastly, I also want to acknowledge our media partners. Um, thanks to Minneapolis Public Radio's uh, 89.3 The Current, Metro Transit, and the Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine. It's been our absolute pleasure to work with the team at The Broad in Los Angeles, as well as the um, Keith Herring Foundation in helping us bring Herring's art and activism to Minnesota. We thank you all for your collabor collaboration, for your guidance and advocacy throughout this project. And I would like to mo take a moment to thank Siri Engberg, um, Senior Curator and Director of Visual Arts, she's sitting right over there, who installed, who uh, is the coordinating uh, curator for the exhibition here. She was supported by Brandon Eng, curatorial assistant. They oversaw the brilliant installation that also highlights um, Herring's, Herring's connection with Minnesota, with Minneapolis and his work at the Walker Arts Center. And of course, I want to thank all of my brilliant um, colleagues across various departments at The Walker who um, helped bring this exhibition to life. So today we are really delighted to have an extraordinary panel here um, to help us launch the exhibition. Um, we welcome Gil Vasquez, Anne Magnuson, Muna Tseng, and moderator Kimberly Drew, who will um, together discuss the exhibition in a moment and talk about Keith's work and legacy. And the panelists will be introducing themselves as they come up to the stage. You have their full bios in your program notes. And before the panel begins, I want to extend a very warm welcome, and it's my pleasure to welcome Sarah Lawyer to the stage. She is the curator and exhibitions manager at The Broad. She's the curator of Keith Haring, Art is for Everybody, and she will introduce the exhibition for us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, thank you for that introduction, Henriette. Um, I am thrilled to be here today to introduce this program and to celebrate the opening of Keith Haring Art is for Everybody here at The Walker, where the exhibition, exhibition is making its final stop. It is so exciting to see the exhibition in the Walker's galleries, and I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Siri Engberg, who has made this show sing with her installation, um, and to the whole Walker team for being great partners. I began working on this project in fall of 2019, and as I prepared to visit the Keith Haring Foundation in New York, the first thing I did was read Keith's journals, and I could not put them down. They are truly a gift 
and a rich supplement to his practice, sharing his insights about art, reflections on his life from just before his 19th birthday until September 1989, just five months before his death at the age of 31 of AIDS-related illness. The title of this exhibition, Art is for Everybody, is taken from a journal entry Keith wrote on October 14th, 1978, penned soon after moving to New York City to attend the School of Visual Arts. Herring had arrived in New York to an insular art world and was part of a generation of young artists who sought to break down those barriers, showing work in public spaces and alternative venues like Club 57, managed by Anne Magnuson, who will be speaking on the upcoming panel. At 20 years old, Keith articulated the idea that art is for everybody, which became the guiding principle of his practice. His goal was to make work that would reach as many people as possible and affect change through his art. Against the odds, he accomplished this. By his mid-20s, Herring had gained wide recognition, showing in galleries and in international exhibitions. Meanwhile, he continued to make work with publics in mind, making thousands of chalk drawings on blank advertising panels in New York City subway stations, for example. With the subway drawings, he, his imagery became part of the fabric of the city, documented by photographer Tseng Kwang Chi, whose sister, Muna Sang, you'll be hearing from shortly. Herring also reached wide audiences by making um, hundreds of murals around the world and hosting workshops with youth, including during a residency here at the Walker in 1984. The exhibition traces the trajectory of Herring's short but prolific career, shining light on key moments and themes. It begins with work made while Herring was a student, experimenting with video and performance, and exploring what it means to make work for public space. In this early period, Herring often made sexuality explicit in his work, having come out soon after arriving in New York. His sexuality was central to his worldview and his practice, and this legacy continues to inspire the queer community today. Herring's breakout exhibition at Tony Schifrazi Gallery in 1982 is represented with a selection of paintings made on tarps with grommets, the kind you might find at a hardware store, um, and also with an immersive room of day-glow paintings and sculptures displayed on striped walls, like Herring had created in the basement of that gallery. Many of the works of this period were collaborations with LA2, Angel Ortiz, Herring was inspired by the burgeoning hip hop culture in New York, including music, breakdancing, and graffiti in, the, in that period of the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and that's exemplified in the show in vibrant paint paintings of breakdancers spinning on their heads and doing backbends. Herring's work also responded to key social and political issues of the era, made in resistance to the conservative movement sweeping the nation after Reagan's election addressing topics like capitalism, religion, and environmentalism. He was critical of capitalism and Reaganomics. This may seem contradictory to the fact that Herring ran a commercial space, but the pop shop was created not with the goal of making money, but to further Herring's mission to make his work as accessible as possible. He frequently used Christian iconography subversively in his work to speak out against the hypocrisy of the Christian right. And he was critical of the Cold War era nuclear arms race, participating in a nuclear disarmament rally in Central Park in 1982, where he handed out 20,000 self-published posters, one of which is in this show. And in 1986, he painted a portion of the Berlin Wall. Herring's AIDS activism is also present, including several posters that show his engagement in the grassroots efforts to provide support and inform the public on how the illness spread. Herring's activism runs parallel to the emphasis he placed on community. He frequently collaborated with other artists and used his imagery and celebrity to support, support causes he believed in. And he seemed to inherently understand that being in community is crucial to being an activist. Alongside the many serious topics Herring addressed in his art and in his, is the distinct experience of joy and exuberance that so much of the work provokes. Oftentimes, Herring accomplished both critique and joy at once. Even when taking on major issues, Herring's work is vivacious 
and optimistic. Despite making mature work for only just over a decade, Herring's work grows and evolves from an artist finding his voice to expansive and complex compositions. The exhibition includes a wide range of mediums, and what ties the diverse objects together is Herring's confident and consistent line. His line really was his medium. Before I conclude, I want to offer thanks to Gil Vazquez, who you'll be hearing from momentarily, and to the entire team and board at the Keith Herring Foundation. Thanks also to the Herring family, to Gladstone Gallery, and to the exhibition lenders. And thanks most of all to Keith Herring. It has been a privilege to bring this exhibition to fruition and spend these past several years studying Keith's line, and an equal privilege to publish the eponymous catalog. The catalog includes the voices of many people who knew Keith personally, including Patty Astor, Kermit Oswald, Kenny Scharf, George Kondo, Julia Gruen, Bill T. Jones, Anne Magnuson, Tony Shafrazi, and Gil Vazquez, alongside essays by myself, Tom Finkelpearl, and Kimberly Drew, who will be moderating today's panel. It has been four decades since Herring came to prominence, and the work remains fresh and relevant, like it could have been painted yesterday. While Herring is well known for his icons and Im imagery that saturate popular culture, I'm excited for the community in Minneapolis to discover how this imagery just scratches the surface of Herring's impact and to be surprised and inspired by Han Herring's expansive practice. Now I'm happy to welcome to the stage the today's panel participants, Gail Vazquez, Ann Magnuson, and Muna Singh, and moderator Kimberly Drew. How's everybody doing tonight? Just kidding. Um, hi. It's so amazing to be here with you all. You could be anywhere. It's Saturday, and all of you nerds are here at the museum talk. Um, it is a true honor and privilege to be here in Minnesota, specifically in Minneapolis. My name is Kimberly Drew. I'm visiting from New York City, where, of course, Keith changed, shifted, enlivened, and continues to inspire our art world. I am joined by our incredible panelists, who I will now hand off to do introductions. I really hate when people talk through the introductions. They are, as we said in your pamphlets, I find them to be like really retrospective in a way. And so I want each of you to tell us who you are uh, and the things that feel relevant to this dialogue. <laughs> My name is Ann Magnuson. I am um, originally from West Virginia. I was interested in theater and film, particularly avant-garde theater um, and rock and roll. And I went to London for my junior year abroad, went back to Denison University to direct a Polish expressionist play and decided it was time to come to New York City. This is Club 57, a club I ended up managing and I made those collage calendars which are available in the gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I met Keith there and got to know him very well and our whole group. I love this when Keith put these up on the, all, on the telephone poles around New York. It's very funny. I love those. Anyway, I, um, I live in Los Angeles now and I'll just hand this over to Gil. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gil Vasquez. I'm the executive director of the Herring Foundation. And I think Keith and I connected mostly, at first anyway, on, on music. Uh, he was a, you know, he was an avid nightclub goer. And nightlife uh, was so important to him. It was such a, a release, I guess, and, and the club scene was so lively, and in a sense, uh, when he got to New York, the clubs were like the common thread from the beginning to the end. So even though it wasn't, when I met, by the time I met him, 57 and, and Mud were long gone, but he was still very much uh, entrenched in, in nightlife. 
so I met Keith in May of 1988. Uh, we became very fast friends. Uh, in 1989, he asked me if I would be interested in being a part of this foundation that he was creating. And at the tender age of 19, my question to him was, what's a foundation? <laughs> uh, and he explained very nicely and very gently that it was a way for us, the people that he chose, to carry out his wishes. And uh, 34 years later, that's what I'm still doing. Amazing. Hi, I'm Muna Sang, and uh, I'm a choreographer dancer based in New York. The reason I'm here is that um, my late brother, Sang Kwang Chi, whose photos you're kind of seeing up there, uh, was very close to Keith. They met kind of in the beginning of both of their times in New York, um, 1989, and uh, began a friendship and a collaborative um, time together, making their own work and intersecting and helping each other make each other's work more relevant. And um, it was a community. And um, I'm here to sort of like talk about how important that community was in the early 80s and um, all through the 90s. Uh, it, it had, you know, we lost both Keith and my brother in 1990. Um, but throughout the 80s, it was just an incredible decade of making art, helping each other, and uh, my, um, Meeting Keith through my brother was uh, also wonderful. So we'll tell more of that later. Um, and very happy that we are here to tell some of those stories together. Right. And of course, we sit here together in 2024, um, a time of such immense grief and such loss. Um, and I wonder if we could talk a bit about the importance of experimentation. One of the things I think about in moments of grief and loss and let's say surveillance as well um, is the importance of abstraction and the importance of existing and finding spaces of refuge. And I wonder if each of you could talk a bit about what it meant to exist in the 80s. I was born in 1990, August 1990, some months after Keith was, had passed. Um, if you guys could talk about that time for those of us who might not be familiar. I guess I'll start. Um, I performed here in 1983, and I was looking at the, the title card, and just seeing 2024. In 1983, I, that seemed like it was 500 years in the future. And to still be alive and witness so much, and that Keith, cannot be here, and Kuang Chi cannot be here, and my brother also passed away from AIDS. And many, many, many of my collaborators, William Fleet Lively, who came here with me to do this wacky show, um, it's, it's interesting, I feel a great privilege to be aging and to be old. <laughs> I hope I get to be older and more of a hag than ever. <laughs> And what, so I've been reflecting a lot on, on those days. Um, the world, I'll try to be concise, not my forte, but I'll the do The stage it. is yours. I'll do We're it. all here, right? We're all here the listening. The world today is so different than when I got to New York in 1978. Keith and I and all our cohorts are more or less the same age, give or take. Born in, in the 50s experiencing the 60s, becoming teenagers during the insane 70s, and then meeting up with each other from all different parts of the world and America to New York City where you had to come because that was where the art, well, that's, where, that's where the cool bands were, that's where the culture was. It wasn't, it, you didn't have access except through television and movies and rock and roll and the records of which we all 
indulged in. And when we met each other, we were like, yeah, I got that record. Oh, I love that, I love that, I love that. Club 57 was a place where I see it as a, it was a space, a shamanic black box for, for living theater. And it could be anything. And that was, I think we were brought up with, it's, it's, it's complex that the, the, the conformity of the 50s into the 60s and the Americana that we grew up in, it was all about, it was pretty square. But then there were the beatniks and you'd read about, the, and then the hippies came in. When Vietnam, we were watching this horrifying carnage over dinner every night. And many of us participated in anti-war protests as young teenagers. I was 15 in the first one. I know Keith being in, following the Grateful Dead was part of a counterculture, and we were all very interested in, in the culture's counter to the what, what currently they're trying to take us back to what is it, 1800 or so. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, this is an interesting cycle that's happening and to witness this. And I think that this, this show, Keith's work, our lives as young people interested in being experimental. I got in trouble in college for not attending the strike of Oklahoma, the set of Oklahoma, because I was doing a Jean Genet play. <laughs> <laughs> in a warehouse way out and so that kind of that kind of we were all attracted to outsiders or people who were just doing things differently and and when we found each other it was an explosion of of joy there was so much laughing there was so much dancing and there wasn't a thought about making money from it i was always told by my dad who lived through the Depression and World War II, life isn't fair. Life isn't fair, and you can't make money in the arts. It's like, okay, <laughs> I'm going there anyway. <laughs> and it's different now. There's sort of like, you can become rich and famous doing this with this stuff. We were like, there was, there was no interference from phones and from all the information. There was a lot of hanging out time. You'd walk around the streets of the East Village and run into people. What's going on? Oh, I'm hungry. Let's go down to this Ukrainian you know, coffee shop. We can eat for $2. You didn't have to have money. The rents were cheap. It was a very dangerous, though. It was very, very challenging. But we were all found camaraderie and community and strength and encouraged each other, and we were in each other's shows. And, and I'll just wrap up this section <laughs> by saying that Keith did some of his first, he did his first, uh, some of his first art shows uh, in Club 57 that invited, the, there was the Club 57 Invitational. And I was, I made these calendars, and any time somebody came in, or I would go f say, look, we've got these dates open, you're a designer, have a fashion show. You're an artist, do this. And, and it was a col very much a collaborative thing. Ideas and programming came from all different directions, many different people. And he wanted to do a show called the Club 57 Invitational, a Xerox and a Xerox art show, an erotic art show, which was dicey because the club was in the basement of a church. <laughs> and the bishop come, it was packed. The bishop starts to come in. And I'm like, oh, Bishop John, uh, I, uh, I've got to talk to you about um, da, 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 da. And I <laughs> took him out, and into, we went down St. Mark's Place to Kiev, and I was like, get him out of there, because there was a large silver phallus, and there was just penises everywhere, and it just sex, 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 sex. Which I don't think he might have cared that much. Well, he might have. Anyway, you know, I thought, ooh, you know. So... He invited everybody to participate, particularly I remember the Xerox art show, and he copied all the, zero, you, brought, you brought in, I, it, when he came to me and said, I want you to be in, I said, oh, I'm not, I can't really draw, and he says, yes, you, I'm not really an artist, yes, you are. And that was Keith's gift, is like, yes, you are an artist, yes, yes. 
So I found this picture I did at three years old of a spider that's actually quite abstract and pretty neat. Put that in, and he Xeroxed every, he made a packet for everybody who had contributed of everybody else's Xerox art. So we left with sort of a, a DIY catalog. Mm -hmm. So this it was the DIY thing, nobody had money. It was a magical time, and it can be created by anybody anywhere. For us in that period of time, it had to be New York. People left other towns either because they couldn't be open about their sexuality or it was just too square, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bit for now. I mean, I think the 80s, you know, in New York City particularly was ripe for experimentation. When we think about New York City as being a mecca for culture, and we say culture as if it's this one big thing, but really what it was then was lots of little subcultures, right? There's hip hop happening up in the Bronx. There's punk that's happening downtown. There's ballroom culture that's happening uptown as a as a almost as a safety measure, right? It, it, it's 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 a refuge for LGBT black folks and Latino folks to to protect themselves, almost almost like a gang, uh, and do these creative uh, things under this this thing called a ball, and that in in and of itself is a culture. Um, and Keith coming to New York City at that time where all these cultures are happening, all these, you know, graffiti culture also was something that, you know, was, was very important to Keith because he, he very much wanted that respect from the graffiti culture. He was not of the graffiti culture. What he was doing was not graffiti. However, uh, he admired the energy that those people exuded uh, bombing the trains and, and just being everywhere, being what they call all city. Uh, he respected that. And I think they looked at Keith uh, as, espe initially especially, as kind of a curiosity. Uh, this guy is drawing, to them, from their perspective, this guy is drawing stick figures with chalk. And, and they're looking at it as like, what? And not really understanding that you know, what he's trying to do is he's trying to bring art to the people. And when he did it to the extent that he did it, where he's all city like them, he gained that respect. Um, the club culture, Paradise Garage. Paradise Garage was a gay and Puerto Rican black club. A white boy from Kutztown, Pennsylvania, <laughs> could not just walk in there and be accepted. Somebody had to vouch for you. Somebody had to walk you in. Uh, and that was probably Juan Dubose, uh, his first uh, love here in New York City. Uh, and you know, Keith was, was accepted into these cultures because of his authenticity. He wasn't trying to be a graffiti artist. The way you know that is because he didn't have a fancy graffiti name like Hayes or Zephyr or Futura. He was Keith Haring. He was himself. Uh, so, you know, just the time really called for a lot of experimentation. You know, the, the Keith that Anne uh, and, and Muna knew was maybe a little bit a, a different Keith than I knew, right? Uh, you know, by the time I got to meet Keith, you know, the tribute to Gloria Vanderbilt was well in his past. Uh, and the silliness that he exuded in, 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 in that video is, is so, like, so charming and so sweet to me, right? Uh, but by the time I got to Keith, he was silly in other ways. Uh, but that informed his performance, like when he painted here at the Walker, you, you can see that it's a performance. He doesn't say a word, he's not dancing around, 
but it, it is truly a performance. So I think all of the experimentation that he did quite early factored into the art later on. Yeah, um, I think performance is you perform for others. So it's like a two-way street. And I think Keith established that right from the beginning. And Quang Chi was also conceptual and performative as a photographer in his own work. So I think in the beginning, when they first met, they, it was an invitation from Keith for my brother to read poetry with him at Club 57. And they went, and we're from Hong Kong. We come from a Chinese family that immigrated to Vancouver, Canada in the mid 60s. And we were miserable. We were like, oh, what are we gonna do here? There's nothing to do. And so as teenagers, we were like, we gotta go somewhere. He went to Paris to art school. He learned his chops as a photographer. And um, then he couldn't stay in France. And the next best thing was New York, the Big Apple. We were all like just drawn to New York as the Mecca because we were kind of in a way unhappy and didn't feel like we belonged. So after I, my university in, in Vancouver, I went there to dance in New York and my brother and I lived on the same block in the East Village on East Fifth Street. My rent was $85, my brother's was 95. So, you know, we're talking about a time where you're free you're free to do stuff because we didn't really have to worry so much about making a living. So we did whatever, you know, waiter, uh, um, Quang Chi had professional job working for magazines and then he would like steal films, you know, from the <laughs> jobs and go, oh, I can go follow Keith, you know, Keith would call him on the payphone and go, I just did subway drawings from, on the E-line from, 53rd and 5th Avenue, MoMA, mm -hmm. pretty savvy. Keith was pretty savvy. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> out to the Queens, out to the Bronx, where, you know, it would be like capturing um, Keith in the act of making art for everybody. And so um, these were times when we were helping each other do our art. The Club 57 shows, like the first um, <clears throat> Club 57 Invitational that Anne was talking about, and then it moved to the Mud Club, and it had became a, uh, a show where Keith would say, hey, you know, Quang Chi, do, do your show, and at that time, Quan Chi was starting his own series of the self-portraits, East Meets West, where he dressed as a Chinese self-appointed cultural ambassador from China, and he would photograph himself all over America. Because we were immigrants seeing America with fresh eyes, and New York provided the kind of like um, center of where people were making their own culture. We were like making our own stuff and for each other. And outside the gallery system, the gallery system came in later. And so there was a certain freedom that's like priceless. And so out of that <coughs> collaborative spirit, in 1982, I was doing a dance concert and I wanted to do Big, big theme, you know, typical young artist, epical songs, history of mankind, you know. <laughs> and so I said to Keith, can, can you do the set for epical songs? Sure. Keith was a guy who said yes, right? No money, we didn't have budget. He wanted first to animate the drawings, we didn't have budget. So he just drew one afternoon his he was living across the street from my dance studio on Broom Street. And he would come over and watch rehearsals. And then I went over, and in his basement, over one afternoon, big stack of paper, 
black felt pens. He just drew all these creatures and lines and babies and dogs and creatures and into the nuclear bomb, into the crawling baby. Because we were all like, this was Reagan had, it, had been inaugurated and there was the Cold War and we were all so concerned about nuclear war and the world coming to an end and what can we do to make the world better? What can we, how can we bring hope into the world? So, you know, the stack of drawings became my set design. And uh, that's the kind of spirit I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, you where, you know, uh, we were just doing stuff because we had to. It was the place where we could come to where there was um, a freedom. And, um, and then, you know, Keith and Kwang Chi traveled the world when Keith got famous and these commissions in Europe and around. And um, it was just a, a, a wonderful, beautiful arc of friendship and making things for the world to enjoy. And the fact that we can be here to enjoy it with you, maybe two generations later now, like we're, we're like 40 years right on. So it's, um, it's really such a joy, a sadness, uh, an honor, a privilege to be alive, right? <laughs> There's this interesting um, intersection when I'm listening to you guys speak of courage and fear. Um, because of course we were talking last night at our dinner about just how broke you guys were. Oh God. <laughs> and of course there is this, um, of course resilience mm -hmm. that you have to have as a base principle when you're up against socioeconomic kind of collapse. Um, there is a fear of being able to make rent. There is a fear of, of trusting each other in a city that at the time was excruciatingly dangerous. Um, and yet you had to be courageous and, and push on. And I wonder if we could talk a bit about courage and fear in relationship to Keith, your relationships to him, and then your own work. Um, gee, I'm reminded of a Camus quote that uh, in the midst of winter, I've got to get emotional. It's very emotional being around all this stuff. In the midst of winter, I found within me an invis invincible summer. And I think we're all born with that, some more resilient than others. Um, yeah, it was very dangerous. The first hour I was in New York, I was mugged and probably could have been killed, but I fought back. And uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, you know, I just, there's also a lot of naive, naivete and I'll show them. And my dad, who grew up very poor, and he told my brother and I, I didn't get any help and neither are you and there's not gonna be anything. And I think that our generation, I noticed with the boys in particular, once they reached a certain age, there were exceptions, but mostly it's like, you're on your own. You're on your own. You just get thrown into the deep end and if you, you better learn to swim or, you know, and I think there was such a high about being in New York there's an opening sequence to the movie Dog Day Afternoon that is really shows what New York was. And it was this like wild carnival kind of. It was, in particular in the summers, it was so insane. People are living on, people are, there's no, you didn't stay in your apartment, you're out on the street, you're, you're just so excited to be away from your parents, to have this crazy freedom, to, to go into clubs, and you find out you get to know who's in the, who's at the door. You get to know the bartender, so you're getting everything for free. Um, it's but resilience is within the the group, and finding the like-minded people, and and just acquiring some street smarts. You don't go down that, you don't go down that block. 
you better turn around. Sometimes I would take this circuitous route just to like, ooh, it looks dice. Oh, I don't know about that one. I better go here and we'll ask people to walk me home. If I had a child who wanted to be there then, a girl, no way. But the parents weren't paying any attention for the most part. I mean, there was parental neglect. And for some people, there was parental abuse. So to get out of that and make your own way and create your own, find your own identity through just all the, the going to the clubs. For me, it started with CBGB in Max's Kansas City. But I was at, working at an uptown theater, mostly learning that I didn't want to work in an uptown theater. <laughs> so it was just too regimented, too confining. Doing the same play over and over again seemed boring, but, and you know, you see Lydia Lunch in CBGB, like, playing an out-of-tune guitar, just <laughs> like, bloody orphans in the, st in the snow, or whatever, <laughs> some crazy, it's just like there was, everything seemed possible, like, people yeah. were doing bands who never could play, and then you learn, you just, it was so wide open, and I was such a big fan of, I'd studied so much of avant-garde theater in college, and I knew about Dada, and I knew about, well, Alfred Jari was my god, and I, I just knew that New York at this like this was all, it was there. It was so we became a movable feast, and very much, all of us were kind of obsessed. Knew about the Weimar Republic, mm -hmm. Berlin in the twenties and thirties. We knew about Paris in the in, at the same time, and 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 Keith in particular was extremely knowledgeable. I mean, he was Keith of, of everybody, and Kwong Chi too, very focused focused but knew how to have a good time and i i guess i don't know if i've answered the question but there, it's just there, there was a, a quote uh, something i wrote in a, a manifesto at one point describing it as a feast of friends a grooving in a group mind mm -hmm. and you're just kind of you know we were happy to and sex i mean you were happy to be on your own and the sexual freedom was crazy. This was before AIDS. So there was a lot of fluidity and a lot of making out and a lot of sharing cabs and just it was this dangerous but exhilarating Disney World of sorts <laughs> with the Warhol vibe. It was just, there was just so much richness. There were so many subcultures, so many different people and you were just I guess from being from West Virginia I was like hi you know I've got the southern thing and you know I didn't know like maybe you don't want to be friends with all of these. some of these people maybe no yeah. but you learn and that's how you become resilient you know you get you get uh, you get hurt but you keep moving on because what are you going to do I remember my parents coming to uh, visit us in New York and they would, you know, always like, Kwang Chi would be coming home at like 3 a.m. and after clubbing, you know, he met Keith like on First Avenue and Fifth Street like at 4 a.m. <laughs> one night. And they were attracted to each other by what they were wearing, right? Keith thought Kwang Chi looked cool. Kwang Chi thought Keith looked cool, right? So they'd exchange phone numbers. So my parents would always go, when are you guys getting a real job? Because yes. <laughs> uh, it's just like, but Keith and Kwang Chi were working all the time. The clubs became their place for experimenting. Kwang Chi did these Polaroid panels where everyone had their 15 minutes of fame, where you come in, it would be theme parties that Anne would come up with. And, you know, royal wedding, Prince uh, Charles marrying Diana, you know, yep. royal wedding, people would show up and, and the Quanchi would have the, ca the Polaroid camera set up. Hello, come in, please, you know, and go up and take a selfie with that person. That person gets to sign the, the Polaroid when, and that, that Polaroid gets collage onto a board that Quanchi had prepared, gorilla style with staples and everyone signed and felt great and 
it was a performance piece. It was a photographic piece. And he also said, later he figured out, how come Keith is always in the center of the Polaroid panels? Because <laughs> Keith had a strategy. He would like wait, you know, because it's sequentially pasted up. He would wait until like, okay, I'm going to be in the center of the Polaroid. Right? So stra strategy, like in a, in a way, like they were smart. Yeah. They had strategy, yeah. but it was not in pursuit of, I don't know, you know, fame or, or career. It wasn't, the career happened because they were so incredibly creative. They were both very organized. They were very organized. And other people were too, but not to the extent that they, those two were. And they were burning their candles at both ends. You know, that was like sort of like w how it all kind of, uh, like the turning point, like mid 90s when AIDS and started to lose people towards the end, you know, the, the group and the friends and the fractioning of that society. But I, I, I think fear, of course there was fear. There was fear walking down the street, like Anne said. But, you know, and America was uh, politically was telling New York to go to hell, right? It was bankrupt. It was dirty. The East Village was like Berlin after the war. And somehow, you know, it's like the comfort factor was each other. And also the freedom. America was telling New York to go to hell, but those of us in certain communities in New York were telling America to go to hell. <laughs> and that, was ex that had its own kind of power and energy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we all found within each other, like, I'm not alone, mm -hmm. and we're all in this together as a community. And and it, the money and the fame wasn't really, in the early years, it was definitely powered by this just joy of being in others, each other's company and creating things. And I would get, I would, they would be in my shows, I would be in their things, and it was just, it was exhilarating and fun and that that will that will trump i hate to use that word <laughs> fear speaking of which you know this stuff can just inspire everybody every new generation like you don't have to go to new york now you can do this in minneapolis you are doing it in minneapolis you can do it there are little pockets in west virginia where interesting things are starting to happen and the real estate's cheap, so let's all move there. <laughs> and West turn, Virginia is so scary. <laughs> turn it blue. Turn it blue. It's not everything they do in the in the they say in the media, but there, yeah, there's that. But hey, that's everywhere. Unfortunately, but, uh, right? But there has to be more, right? We have to believe that one, our communities everywhere deserve that, right? I think I'm I'm a byproduct of family from the Midwest, and in New York, everybody's like, oh, the Midwest, there, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, but the people who are here have a radical tradition. As a black American, there's an incredible radical tradition of us coming here for freedom. And so for us as a nation to turn our back on it isn't fair. But to also sit in the reality of that, like I was saying, that juxtaposition of courage and fear, we have to. If I could just uh, say a couple words about fear and courage as it relates to Keith. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can barely think of a time when I saw fear in Keith. I mean, I think his only fear in my experience was the fear of maybe not knowing how long he would live. But everything about his journey, him leaving his hometown, uh, courage, him drawing, making these drawings in the subway and could potentially get arrested, courage. Him being out, courage. Him being, uh, him being, you know, announcing to the world that he's HIV positive, courage. Painting what he painted, you know, quote unquote difficult work, right? Which, you know, to this day, you know, affects sponsorships and, and things like that courage so 
that that's the Keith Haring I knew. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about. I love Keith's like kinky edge because I feel like we live in such a sexless time. Um, and of course, one of those things is because we are currently surviving a pandemic, right? We are in a moment of really well-justified fear of each other. I look at my friend's kids who are seeing each other, like seeing family members smile for the first time because we've had to take all of these protective measures in how we engage with each other. Um, and as we are unfortunately wrapping up, I only have a few more questions for you all and appreciate your generosity thus far. Thus far. Um, I wonder if we could talk about what your hopes are for now and not to, I mean, I love like critical fabulation and thinking about uh, what Keith might want and I don't want to invite you to do that if it doesn't feel good and safe, but I wonder if you could talk about were Keith to still be with us and in your own experience of this time, this window of time, what you hope for now. Uh, so just on, on, a, on a note, like so last night, we were at this dinner last night, right? And a gentleman that I sat next to was telling me about his, uh, I think, stepdaughter, 31-year-old uh, woman uh, who had probably not really heard about Keith Haring or didn't know that much about Keith Haring. Uh, and as they're telling her about Keith Haring, uh, one of the things they said was that he had died of AIDS. And her remark was, I didn't know you could die from AIDS. So that's, ga for, you know, you know. Uh, good, no? well, again, so that, yeah. that's what I'm getting to. You know, I, I am now the age that old people are. So, you know, it's shocking, <laughs> shocking to me. But in, in a way, it's like, it's really shocking and like, oh my God, like, where do we go wrong? But this, this young woman doesn't know a world where people died from HIV. So that might be an example of, you know, something Keith would ponder about. I think Keith would be all over the politics, fighting fascism. Fascism is here, and it, we, got, we got to fight it. This is what he would be fighting, that, that they're trying to roll away all the rights of women, of, and it's all gonna, and if they keep doing it, it's, you know, it's, we were all pretty inf influenced by the movie Cabaret in the Weimar Republic. The Nazis are here, and Keith would be fighting the fuck out of them. I'm sorry, he right. would be. Right. Yeah. And he would be involved with, he'd be in Washington. Uh, he would just, I think he would have kids. And he would just keep giving. Yeah. And he would figure out like a smart, good way to use social media and AI. You know, I mean, it's like, he knew how to get his message out. And his message always had positivity. And so in this world where we're living with so much fear and uh, distrust of each other, you know, it would be like rays of sunshine <laughs> on a rainy day. I, I think that it, it, it would like have to beam it out there his message. Yeah, I'm so bored with pessimism. I am like <laughs> over it. I'm like such a social media baby. I'm a millennial, wah, wah, wah. But there is something so much about like the difference between tweeting out I like my sandwich and I hate my sandwich and the metrics on it because people really do corral and reside in negativity in a way that I'm not even sure I really understand. Um, and that makes the work of everyone who brought this exhibition together all the more important. We do sit in a moment where we need not just optimism, not just positivity, because I think one of the things I most admire about Keith is that it is born of hurt. It is born of this difficulty. He didn't just decide to be happy and draw these babies. Like it comes within a context. It comes within resilience as we've been talking about. Um, and I wonder, uh, as we're closing, and then we're going to open to questions, we're going to take a few questions. Um, 
I guess I wonder from each of you, now that we're coming to the end, what you really want people to understand about Keith Haring. I think his history of being a deadhead <laughs> is very important. We were all, as kids, drawn to hippies and the counterculture. And this was the let the sun shine in and the flower power. And his art has a, is sort of a reflection of this kind of make love, not war, ban the bomb. And so this uh, pushing back against authority, its dominance hierarchies, and, and stepping, making a lateral move and saying, you know, I'm not playing that game, man. I mean, there's, there is that spirit of, um, well, the Club 57 thing, because it was so, it was so bleak down there, bleak and dangerous, and some people unfortunately got hooked into the drugs, and then they just, that was the end. And Club 57, I always saw, and Kenny Scharf and the whole other group, this was a place you could be joyful, you could be silly, you didn't have to be cool, you know, this cool thing. And, and dance, and be, you could be, we had our serious moments, but there was an optimism there that came out that we remembered from childhood because our parents' generation had survived this hideous, hideous war and they wanted stability. And we were all going to go to the moon on Pan Am flights. There was going to be a shuttle that Pan Am had every week to the moon. And it was like, wait, and the Jetsons and all this, Disney and the, you know, the Fantasia and all the color and, and the cartoons and everything was just, and then it's like, wait a minute, where are those flights to the moon? We're not, we're, we'll, we'll have to create, we're going to do, we did a, a salute to NASA and built a spaceship in the club. And there's great video of Keith coming out wearing this jumpsuit and like, <laughs> so you see it in the videos and, the, that, and you did it on no money. There was no money and we pull in refrigerator boxes from just garbage from the street, make the sets, have the event and then throw it out in the street the next day. The disposability of it. So. I don't, this is a circuitous way of just that this was a place where we celebrated a positive attitude. And that, in your, in, when you're in the midst of winter, there has to be the invincible summer that you, as an individual, can shine out. Let the sun shine out and in and out and in and out. I think what I want people to come away with about Keith Haring is that he had the audacity to think that he could change the world for the better. Uh, and I think that he has. Uh, I think some of the issues that he experienced uh, in the world still persist. There are things, you know, that are, that are still going on. But he had the audacity to think that he could change the world for the better. And I think the work hopefully inspires all of us to do the same. And it doesn't mean you have to be a famous artist. Uh, I think you can, you can change the world by being kind to your neighbor, by you know, doing something positive, by teaching. Uh, so we can all do it in our, in our own way, but you know, we, we have to, have the audacity to believe that we can positively change the world. I think the message that um, I'm left with uh, in remembering Keith and his work is like, keep saying yes. Find your, your team because you need a team, and know the game. He was not Pollyanna about the world. And what is the game today? And how do we 
say yes to that? And what can you contribute for that game to be played in the way that you want the world to play it? Um, and I think that's kind of like what I feel, you know, that all that sharing, all that community, and why this work is still so relevant and so alive. Thank you all so very much. I don't know how, how to even thank you. I don't work here at Walker Art Center, so I don't know how you guys usually do Q&As, uh, but I do believe that we can bring microphones around to folks, um, and I think that the microphones are moving. If it is within your physical capability to raise your hand, please do. If not, we'll find a solution. Hi, uh, my name is Michael. Um, I guess my question would be if, if you could go back and, and tell Keith anything about where we are in 2024 as a society, um, and I guess, well, I didn't really think this through very well, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's it just really in any aspect. If, it, I'm sorry if that's too... That's no, a fab question. Okay, sorry. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks. Keith, you will not believe what is going on right now. You are not going to, we need you. Uh, it's complicated. I think that's the There's long and short of it, right? It's, it's too it's, much information. You are not going to believe what's going on in 2024. Hi, my name is Annie Plum, and some people know me. I worked for Tony Shafrazi from his like second day in business when Keith was in the subways shortly thereafter. And I just thought of something funny. <laughs> no, I mean, I had never thought about it before. You know, in, in reality, um, <clears throat> Keith had been an employee of Tony's when before he had a gallery in Soho, when he had a little fledgling gallery in his apartment. And then, you know, later there was me, you know, employee of Tony's. Most people know Tony, something about him, he's quite a character. And so, and I'm just thinking of funny in relationship with that. And then <clears throat> Tony just couldn't be here today and he just wanted to make sure that he asked if I could say a great <clears throat> thank you to everybody and that, you know, th that he's sorry he can be here and he's seen the show through the other exhibitions and that it's wrapping up. And um, I just wanted to say something about um, the overall of what your, what my impression or past, future, you know, whatever about Keith is um, what's really, what Keith was, was a person that was on a mission, you know, mm -hmm. and it wasn't about getting famous or making money or, but, and it wasn't, you know, whatever, changing the world, you know, in politics or something, it gets a little bit more specific. I mean, basically, the whole thing that he did with the lines and the, the you know, caricatures and the, you know, pictographs, it's it's very um, uh, basic and very um, you know what's the word I want you know it, organic and 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 overreaching as yeah. well as like you know fundamental and yeah. abstract in and but and grand abstract and grand. Mm -hmm. Annie, but before I got here, I spent an hour on the phone with Tony, and if you know if you know Tony, that's a short conversation. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, Tony obviously was uh, really instrumental in, in guiding Keith and channeling that talent and that energy. Uh, uh, you know, really, that, that 82 breakout show was, was, you know, radical even by today's standards. So shout out to Tony Shafrazi, who had a lot to do with uh, who Keith became. And so many other artists. in the front. Hey, thanks for the conversation today. It was really great. Um, in the spirit of Keith Haring, tell me something good about today and tomorrow. <laughs> something about today? I mean, tell me something good about today and tomorrow. Or something optimistic, positive. Oh. 
something good about today. I mean, listen, we're alive. Yeah. The fact that we are here it is 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 a statistical yeah. miracle, right? I, I you know yeah. because of social media, you you know I, I'm a big fan of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So you know he he talks about you know the statistical probability of of, of any one of us being here is somewhere like it's just like a stratospheric crazy number so the fact that we're here is miraculous and i think that in and of itself is a good thing for today and tomorrow yeah and i will say too um oh yeah uh i i also just i feel like i would be remiss not to just remind everyone how much work goes into a show like this, how much work it takes to bring us here, the people who are setting up the chairs, who are our incredible AV team. Um, it is such an honor and privilege, truly, to be gathered around each of you in this moment of such love and affection, like, that this show has been in the making for the last five years through such trial and tribulation. It is not easy to do. It is not easy to remain optimistic. I turned in my essay very late. <laughs> um, and to have that level of compassion and trust and care uh, really reverberates. And I feel so much of it through Keith, even though I am the singular person on the panel who didn't know him. Um, and so I just sit in gratitude. And, and I, I want to thank all of you for being here, all of you for being here. Um, and with that, We'll say good afternoon. Please go see the show. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Bring them along with you, um, and and continue to keep Keith's name in your mouth. Yeah. Thank you.